On today's episode of Watch Jericho, we try to fix the Ford Power Shift. Who am I kidding? It's unfixable. What is going on guys? I am Watch Jergo and today, like I said, I am here with my girlfriend's, I think 2015 Ford Focus with a power shift in it. This is a pretty loaded Ford Focus. In reality, it's not a titanium, but it's pretty loaded. And built 02 of 15, there we go. So now we know when it was built and it's actually an SE. So a E85 capable SE Ford Focus with the four cylinder with the dual clutch Ford power shift transmission. A very, very problematic transmission that kind of ruined the Focus's amazing reputation for being really reliable at a very, very reasonable price. So let's jump in this thing, check it out. I've heard the check engine lights on, it's bucking at stoplights, it's having all the problems in the world. Let's jump in there, see if we can experience it. I never have and figure out what's going on with the check engine light and see if we can fix it as well. So let's take this thing for a drive. That's probably the way to start it. Uh, I'd love to actually have this problem happen to me. Apparently it just won't take off at all from some stoplights. Let's see. What's unfortunate about this problem is you can see that check engine light right there. And then if you look right there in the center display, this thing only has 68,000 miles on it. It's comparatively brand new to a lot of cars on the road. And she takes good care of it. You know, it's clean. And uh, I mean, the seats aren't ruined. The seat covers are there for style reasons. It's got heated seats. I think it even has a heated wheel possibly. So like I said, relatively loaded and we're gonna go uh, try to sort out this problem today. Unfortunately, I do think it is unfixable and everyone does understand that the power shift transmission, uh, wow. I was at like 10% throttle before the transmission decided to engage the clutches there. Really weird. It's just kind of strange being in a non supercar that has a dual clutch or, you know, high end luxury car. So I love dual clutches to death. Um, but usually, you know, I would expect hiccups in a supercar. They normally aren't good. Wow, what a terrible shift. It worked so hard for what it was one, two. It was like, that's the exact movement I could feel. And it wasn't like, you know, clutch slipping or anything. That's just what it did. So kind of weird. Not loving the driving dynamics. Like I said, in a supercar, you expect them to be bad. They should be bad. It's what adds to the fun, the drama. You're like, oh, that is wild. But in a daily driver, you're like, this should not be happening. This should be super smooth and simple and really never have a problem until these days, 150,000 miles for the most part. You could, you could probably buy one of these in 2015 and drive it to 100, uh, I don't know about with a power shift, but with a manual, you could probably drive it to 150,000 miles and never even change the oil and throw the car away at the end. And that would probably work out for you. Unfortunately, wow, is this in sport? 3,500 RPM to get that shift? All right, it does say S in the gauges, but I'm pretty sure that's because we're headed south. That's hill descent right there. Hill descent off. You see those shifts? Don't they look horrible? <laughs> You'd think they would be nice and snappy with a dual clutch. Who am I to judge how it's shifting though? I only care that it's broken, that it should start bucking or I should see some RPM jumping up and down or something like that. And maybe it is. I'm not moving my foot at all. Oh, that's clutch slip. Oh, that is absolutely happening. Let's see if I can show you guys this, but the uh, tax moving, you know, about two, 300 RPM as it's driving down a flat road. Let's set the cruise. There's really close to 1500, there's 1700. It's going downhill. Why would it be picking up RPM? Oop, I'm not really driving here. That's my bad. Back to about 1750. They're coming for us. That's a state trooper. Anyway, usually if I saw some RPM change like this, now it's kind of settled out of around 1,550 or something like that. But, okay, just kidding, there's almost 1,750. <laughs> there is like a 200 RPM bounce in this thing. We're gonna accelerate. Oh, what on earth? That's clutch slip, isn't it? 
I was maybe 50% throttle and it gave me a ton of RPM. I don't know if that's just how these drive. I, you know, I could be completely wrong. Let's set the cruise again, 60 mile an hour. All I know is if I experienced that in a supercar, I would be like, well, clutch is shot. Let's put the clutches in it. But this thing should not have bad clutches. And the only way it would have bad clutches is if the power shift transmission control module destroyed the clutches because she drives this thing super slow, never hard on it. So let's park this thing, hook the scanner up to it, see what the check engine light's for, and then, you know, based on how she's described the problem to me, I think it's a low voltage issue. And I've heard other people have kind of fixed their power shifts with, uh, you know, solving a low voltage issue, uh, voltage drop on one of the grounds. So let's go see what's going on and see if we can fix this thing. And even better, see if we can fix this thing for free. But if it needs the old power shift transmission control module, we're in trouble. Because as you guys know, those things are unobtainium. They're basically all broken, so they're all sold out, and they're also very expensive. Uh, honestly, so expensive that we'll probably just get rid of the car. That control module can be like $1,500, and this car is probably worth, I mean, 10 on its best day, seven on its worst day, something like that. So uh, yeah, you just sell the car if it's broke. Oh, there, it did it to me. That is half throttle. And that was still half throttle. Then the clutch grabbed at 4,000 RPM and engaged at three. Well, from the way it's driving, it feels like bad clutches. I sure hope it's not actually a mechanical issue. I think it's the clutch actuators not being able to do their job. So let's find out if that's true. Let's get the hood open here too, because if we're gonna try to fix this, we need the hood open. Everyone's favorite car is sitting right there. I know you guys like to see it in the background. All right. Before we jump in here, let's spend a couple of seconds talking about what a dual clutch is. I know I just say like automatic dual clutch, single clutch, all that stuff all the time, but basically a manual is your normal manual transmission. You've got a clutch and you've got a shifter and you pick the gear and you engage the clutch when you want with your foot. And then you have a single clutch, which is a computer controlled manual transmission. So you have a computer that picks the gears, usually with some hydraulic actuators that are sitting right on top of the transmission. So it's literally the same manual you'd have, but with a computer controlling the shifter and one more computer that runs the clutch. So it's got like a computer controlled solenoid, hydraulic actuator that's moving the clutch in and out. A manual transmission would be the slowest, most antiquated thing on the planet. A single clutch would be kind of the third because automatics were after that, hydraulic automatics for the most part. Then you'd have single clutches, then you have dual clutches, which are the, you know, the ultimate tier of transmission. In between your single clutch and your dual clutch, you have the standard hydraulic automatic. Many of those are incredibly fast now, like the ZF8 HPs, and then of course the A10, all of the great transmissions of our day today that shift faster than single clutches and almost hang with dual clutches at this point. Very, very good automatics these days. And then of course this, which should be the highest tier of transmission, but then they put it in the cheapest economy car on the planet. What a compromise, right? In a, in a supercar, a DCT can cost $30,000. In this car, a DCT has to cost $1,500 because it's the price of the car. Like $30,000 is some of the nicest focuses on the planet, let's be honest. So you've got your good dual clutches in the supercars, and then you have this dual clutch. And a dual clutch, also very simple. Uh, it just has two clutches, right? You've got an input shaft that splits its power between two clutches that are going down two shafts. And down each shaft, you got a gear set. You got gear set odd, gear set even. So you have one, three, five, maybe seven, maybe. And then you have two, four, six, maybe eight, depends on how many gears are in your dual clutch. Many of them are seven speeds, but I mean, it's whatever. You can build it with as many speeds as you want. And then when you need to change gears, instead of using your foot or having a computer control a solenoid, uh, it's very simple on this. You have two different solenoids to engage either clutch and say you're in gear one and you want gear two. Well, all you have to do is release the clutch on gear one and engage the clutch on gear two. And when you need to go from two to three, you do the opposite, just like that. So it's instantaneous, right? You got two clutches, it lets you shift instantly. And that's why dual clutches rock. Anyway, you could go check out better explanations of this on Engineering Explained, but basically the point of this whole thing is Ford put a dual clutch in this super cheap car and what did they expect? I'm pretty sure they left it right after this generation and went back to a traditional automatic. And I think you can still order this thing with a manual, maybe, but it didn't work out. It's safe to say the power shift was an absolute disaster for Ford and 
hopefully we can remedy the problems on this one today, at least a little bit. This thing needs an engine mount. It has blown all of its fluid out. Take a look at that passenger side mount. There is goo everywhere. Okay, we just finished scanning the car and we have exactly one code. Look at that. Not a single issue. All of these modules simply aren't installed. This has old school manual climate. It does have a heated steering wheel, like I thought. Uh, but yeah, it basically has no fancy options like we would expect today. Still loaded though, it's kind of weird. It's just a weird setup. Heated seats, heated steering wheel, but no touchscreen, no big sink. One code, P0902. Let's see. The Autel can quickly tell us what 0902 is. Clutch A, actuator control circuit low. Clutch is hydraulically disengaged. It is controlled electro-hydraulically by the TCM and actuated by the clutch actuator. So the control module detects that the clutch actuator circuit is shorted to ground. So maybe it's not clutch dis. Because of the number of files on your media device, what? some speech commands are not available for this device. Are you kidding me? Uh, replace the clutch actuator, repair circuits, or test the TCM. And we do know if there is actually an issue here, it's probably the TCM and nothing else because the power shift is famous for having bad TCMs. So there's a lot of discussion about this problem possibly being related to a bad ground. And the main ground from the battery over to the chassis is this one right here, this black cable right over here by the driver's side corner of the hood. So what we're gonna do today is pop off that little bolt right there, which is also the jump starting tab. And you know, the jump starting tab has good metal to metal contact there, but this ground gets its ground from the threads inside that nut that's welded on there. Sorry if that got a little blurry. What we're gonna do is pull this cable off and then take some of the paint off of here, put a little dielectric grease underneath it and then shoot it back in so that hopefully we have a better ground from the battery to the rest of the car. With that done, maybe there will be less voltage sag, which will allow the TCM to operate properly or within the parameters that it expects. And as you saw, one of the troubleshooting steps there was replace faulty circuits or fix faulty circuits. So maybe the most important circuit on the car, that ground right there, isn't the greatest circuit. So we're gonna hopefully give it a better connection, a better path from the battery ground to the body of the vehicle. And from there, obviously the transmission will be grounded to the chassis as well. Maybe it'll work out better. The battery is of course under that box right there. This is a brand new Superstart Platinum that I got from O'Reilly's 10 of 22 and put this in this car. So I don't think it's a bad battery, although I am noticing a little bit of uh, battery acid around the terminal back there. So that's always cool. Uh, we're just gonna go ahead and pop this loose. Ooh, she's mad now. She's getting mad every time I touch her. Come on. I should have pulled it off the battery first. The problem is it's really, really, really hard to get the negative terminal off. You have to disassemble half the car. I have done this. I guess we're gonna pull the positive side. At this point, I might just take the whole battery back out and uh, good thing I got spare those little T-bolt connectors in my truck. All right, at this point, like I said, I may tear the whole battery out and put a little bit of uh, terminal grease back there on that back one to make sure this doesn't happen again. Because the problem's slowly gotten worse over the last year, which corresponds with that thing slowly having some battery acid on that back terminal. Let's fix it all at once. All right, we finally have the little jump start stud out of here. Looks fine. Doesn't look like any welding was going on there. Pull this guy off and you can see that's 100% painted. There's paint in the threads and everything. It's literally all paint. So this is a nice bare connector as you'd expect right there. It's even keyed so it only goes in one way. But that is, first it sounds cool. Second, it's covered in paint. Take the paint off however you want. Scotch Bright pad, sandpaper, wire brush, or I have a uh, 3M Rolock disc, and that's what's on the Milwaukee.co, so we're gonna use that. I'm gonna take it all the way off around where that bracket actually touches, and hopefully that gives us a much better ground. It is welded, so that's a good ground. The welds, probably amazing, but the paint, probably not great. That ought to work. I need to wipe all this uh, powdered paint off of there now, but now that we've exposed that tab properly, let's get a little bit of uh, dielectric grease on there, something to keep that from ever rusting. Put our 
ground cable back on, and then pull the battery out, clean up that terminal, and put it all back. Now that I've got the battery hold down off and the battery pulled forward a little bit, you can see all the battery asset on that back connector there, the negative side, and you can see all the paint that's been removed and I cleaned up everything down there. And we've got some dielectric grease to put all of this back. So I'm gonna go ahead and clean this connector off like crazy with a wire brush, try to get any remnants of battery asset out of there. And hopefully a little dielectric grease will keep that from happening again as well. So let's get to it. All right, the entire battery cable has been removed and cleaned up and I've got some dielectric grease here that's gonna go on the terminal and over here on the, the new bare paint side. So we're gonna goo that up nice. Goo it up nicely. Obviously I don't need that rusting. And as long as we've got that grease there, we've got a nice little barrier to keep the rust from ever forming. So. That looks pretty good. And while we're at it, I'm gonna put just a bit down here in the terminal. Last time I had this off, I cleaned that terminal because it already looked bad back then on the old battery. So this time, it will be covered in the goo. So there's a little uh, amp clamp here so the car knows how much current it's pulling. Snap that back on. That drops in here. This drops in here, and this drops in here as well, and that goes on there. And that's how it all goes back together, just like that. So I'll get that terminal on there a little bit better, tighten it down, and we'll put this bolt back in, clean up, get all this grease off my hands, put it back together, and test it out. Battery's hooked back up, last cover going in place. I am not a fan of the battery box on this car in the slightest. Not even a little bit. Okay. I think she's finally back where she belongs. Hopefully if you're doing this possible fix to your Ford Focus, you don't need to do that much work. Hopefully the battery connection's good and this should just take about 30 seconds. But if you have to pull all of that, you know, chalk it up to 30 minutes total. Uh, you gotta pull the battery hold down, pull the battery forward. The ECU is the front of the battery box. That's gotta come off. Battery box has to expand. There's a lot of steps. This one should be good to go now. Uh, another reason why I think this could be a voltage thing is because those clutch actuators pull a ton of power. Electronically moving a clutch, you can imagine, that takes a little bit of force. So if we fix a bad ground, there's a good chance that we fix it all. I gotta go drop this dielectric grease back off at my dad's. We'll take the Escalade over there. I guess we could just take the Focus, but I was enjoying driving the Escalade around because it's a great parts runner. We'll take the Focus, we'll clear the codes, and let's get a drive cycle on it and see if it's any better. For some reason here in the live data, I think everything looks perfect. If you're a Ford tech, let me know if something doesn't, like why is their clutch a slip when it's in park? Maybe that's expected, but we also see a bunch of no faults here. And clutch B kind of mirrors clutch A. I'm not seeing really clutch B learned touch point, 12.6 millimeters, clutch A learned touch point, 13.65 millimeters. So, I mean, they're basically the same. I'm not really seeing a big issue here. What on earth? Clutch motor A, short circuit to ground. That might be the new issue because I don't think this was happening before. I think everything looked perfect before. And I just cleared the codes and for some reason, look at that, continuous code, there's one set. Uh, let's clear it again. The nice orange glow from the check engine light to keep us warm at night. And let's fault scan again and TCM code is set. Well, clearing the codes again seems to have done the trick. It finally did turn the check engine light off here. So now I'm gonna take it for a drive and hopefully it's better. And just like that, the check engine light's back. Let's take off from this stoplight. 30% throttle. It seems nice and smooth. And then it does that. There's it picking back up. What a mess. I didn't move my foot a millimeter that entire time. So after all of that, and then looking at the live data, I really do think it's got a dead TCM. That short circuit to ground in there is the thing that kills me. Uh, it wasn't doing that before. And a long time ago, I cleared this check engine light. It went away, no problem. It seemed like it was driving fine. I probably should have done these fixes back then and maybe I would have had a chance of prolonging its life. Uh, there's a good chance these TCMs are failing because of bad power conditions. And if you save it early enough, maybe you'll win. Maybe you won't have to replace one, but if you do need to replace one, I, like I said, 1500 bucks, you might be six months from getting one of those modules. This thing's getting traded in tomorrow. We're not putting a transmission in this car. It's, it's as much as the car to put a transmission in it. So it's just not gonna happen.
Plus you can still drive it. Like who knows when it'll actually break, but right now it's already annoying. So time to uh, eliminate the problem. There you have it. Trying to save the notoriously failure prone forward power shift and it not working out pretty much as we all expected. Anyway, that is it for today, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to head on over to shopwatchchairgo.com for cool shirts, not like this. And please like, share, subscribe, do whatever you want to do, and I will talk to you next time. Oh well, I guess she's taking the volt, and uh, this can stay here until it's gone.